When you send a personal message, someone you love, you will sign that. You will sign that message in such a way that expresses that fondness you have for them, the relationship you have with them. So our Lord, as it were, signs the cross with his blood. But when he appeared to the apostles after his resurrection, they looked for the signature on his body, the signature of the wounds that he suffered. They saw the opening in his hands and his side. In fact, it was our Lord himself who bade them come forth to examine those wounds when he appeared to them on Easter Sunday night, the very night of his resurrection. When he came to them in that upper room where they were all still hiding in terror, our Lord appeared there in the midst of them. They thought they had successfully barred the doors to all of their enemies. But now that our Lord appeared to them there in that upper room, they were actually afraid of him. <clears throat> what were they to think? Is it indeed a specter that has appeared to us? Is it even him risen from the dead? How they must have felt intimidated by that presence now because each one of us was confronted with his own, his own betrayal. From Peter on down, And yet our Lord immediately assured them. He bade them peace, a statement of his friendship to them, undiminished. And then he asked them to come and look at his wounds to see that it is indeed himself risen from the dead. And so those wounds are signature wounds. Even the stigmata to this day even though those wounds may appear in the bodies of others, we recognize them as the wounds of Christ. So it was in the shroud, the shroud of Turin. So our Lord had left that message for all of us throughout the centuries, and they had signed it with his own signature and his own blood. On the shroud, we see here the image of our Lord. Crucified, died, buried, and now evidently at the moment of the resurrection when the soul and the body reunited and some tremendous energy emblazoned that image on the shroud as a message to each and every one of us today. The sign of Jonah, indeed. Now, Father Gronings in his chapter 31 talks about the wonderful events before and at the death of Christ. He says the great drama enacted on the first Maundy Thursday and Good Friday in Jerusalem and in its vicinity is gradually approaching its end. As we have considered in our meditations, both heaven and earth follow the destinies of the divine sufferer, which with close, yea, with restrained attention, each, however, in a different way. The passers-by suspiciously shook their heads. The executioners and the thief to the left ridiculed him. The Pharisees, scribes, and chief priests rejoiced in his downfall. Pilate, in the beginning, hesitated to pronounce the death sentence and finally washed his hands as a sign of innocence. Herod and his wife, the adulteress, laughed. The apostles fled in horror. They could not bear the sight. Procula, the wife of Pilate, was so deeply moved and agitated that she dreamed of it. Veronica and other pious women shed tears of compassion. Simon of Cyrene felt at first reluctant, then blessed to have become, without his own merit, 
an actor in the great event. Dismas, the thief, loudly proclaimed the innocence of Christ, even from the cross. Even an angel appeared on the scene to inspire the divine sufferer with courage in the performance of his difficult role. Mary, the mother of Jesus, John, and Magdalene, stood at the side of the Savior, consoling him in his last moments. Lastly, the Heavenly Father received with open arms the soul of his dying Son. But we rightfully ask, shall nature remain indifferent and look coldly on whilst her Creator and Lord is struggling with death and whilst the Immortal One is breathing forth his soul in nameless tortures? Certainly not. The sun became darkened. The veil in the temple was torn from top to bottom. The earth trembled and quaked. The rocks were rent and the graves were opened. Let us consider these wonderful events in themselves. These events occurred in part before the death of Christ and even at the moment of his death. Before the death of Christ, there occurred a total eclipse of the sun during three hours. This fact is historically so well substantiated that there can be no doubt about it. The evangelists, three evangelists, testify to it. The evangelists Matthew and Mark write, from the sixth hour there was darkness over the whole earth until the ninth hour. St. Luke writes, the sun was darkened. If a historian or a newspaper correspondent wishes purposely to spread some lie broadcast over the world, he will select imaginary events which, owing to their very nature, do not happen in public, or at least such that they are obliged to have happened in some remote corner of the earth. But to report, for instance, that some years ago an extraordinary eclipse of the sun happened in this town, when everyone knows it would be untrue, will not occur to anyone. This eclipse of the sun was, however, not a natural one. It was miraculous in every respect, and that for three reasons. First, it occurred at the time of the full moon. For this Friday was the day when, according to the law, the Pasch should be celebrated. And this feast always occurred at the time of the full moon. Now, naturally, an eclipse of the sun can occur only at the time of the new moon, when the latter is between the sun and the earth. Then it was miraculous because it was total right from the beginning, and lastly, because it remained total during the three hours of the crucifixion. In an ordinary eclipse of the sun, the moon in the beginning covers only a part of the sun, then gradually more until the darkness reaches its greatest height, whereupon it again gradually decreases. This eclipse of the sun was therefore an extraordinary work of God, and the Holy Fathers freely apply to it the words of the prophet Amos, and it shall come to pass in that day that the sun shall go down at midday, and I will make the earth dark in the day of night. Amos chapter 8, and at about the year 200, Tertullian, speaking of this wondrous eclipse, thus spoke to the Romans, you yourselves have recorded this great event in your annals. What was the meaning of this eclipse? On the part of heaven, it was the garb of mourning, wherewith the sun clad itself while the sun of justice was being extinguished. Creation, says St. John Chrysostom, could not bear the indignities inflicted upon the Creator. For the Savior, to whom a loincloth only was left, the eclipse was a veil woven by compassionate nature to cover his nakedness. On the part of God, it was a sign of his anger. God withdrew, even from the just, the light of the sun, which he otherwise let shine even upon the wicked. At the birth of Christ, in the middle of the night, the splendor of God's glory 
encircled the shepherds and brightness reigned. At his death struggle, the sun standing high in the heavens became obscured and darkness reigned. Thus also does brightness spread in the soul when Christ is born in the heart. But the gloom of night enters when he departs from the soul. Wherefore, the eclipse of the sun was also an image of the blindness and obstinacy of unbelievers. This eclipse ended at the death of the Redeemer. Then again did the sun appear in his beauty after the storm. Now divine justice was reconciled. The sacrifice was consummated. Now the soul of Christ, which had been sad unto death, was delivered from all afflictions and was unspeakably blessed. Now the souls of the patriarchs and saints of the Old Testament shared in the brilliancy of heavenly light and in the joys of the vision of God. Now the darkness which had hovered over the earth for 4,000 years was dispelled through the death of Christ and the new day of salvation had dawned. Now, through the light of grace, all darkness was also to be driven out of the hearts of men. Father Gerning's words are very beautiful with regard to that. He does tie the darkness that enshrouded the earth during our Lord's crucifixion. He does relate that to the brightness in the sky over Bethlehem announcing our Lord's birth 33 years before. He might also have mentioned the star that appeared in the sky, miraculous star lighting the way for the Magi through the darkest of nights and so bright even by day. So that brilliant of brilliance of light that shone over the shepherds and the star that shone in the sky for the Magi now that was replaced by darkness. As Christ was suffering, it's as though the world itself, in a sense, the sun itself had closed its eyes and could not bear to watch what was taking place here on this earth. Father Grinning's words talk about the shroud even concealing the exposure of our Lord on the cross, covered in darkness, the entire world was in mourning. Pope Pius XII actually recalled this event. When Pope Pius XII was elected the Pope in 1939, he spoke of the events of the world at that time and how our Lord was, as it were, being driven from the world again. And he refers to the fact that there was darkness that covered the earth when they crucified Jesus. And he said, so must it ever be when mankind rejects its savior, that that darkness will cover the earth. And yet for those who have this sanctifying grace of God in their souls, they will always have that, that lamp, as it were, that lucerna burning in their hearts. And so it will always be true of them the Lord will be a lamp unto my feet, even in the most penetrating darkness. Darkness will not penetrate. The darkness will not comprehend it, because the light burning in that lamp of my soul is no less than the divine life of God's grace. What could be more important than that, to keep that, to keep that lit during one's life at all times? And in the misfortune that in the storms of the world that light of grace has been extinguished to hasten to relight it again, to have that lamp of Christ burning in the souls as a lamp unto my feet, even in the great darkness of this world. My dear faithful, we now face a world which is threatening to try to drive our Lord, even the very memory of our Lord, out of it. In fact, we find that's what the high priests intended to, to do. They said that they must drive out of the world not only Christ, 
but even the memory of him from the souls of men. And so it has always been the objective of Christ's enemies. They realized that they had to drive him out of the world, drive his grace out of the world, but they also had to drive his memory, because even that memory represents the glimmer of faith. And as one of the great enemies of our Lord Voltaire said, even if we allow the memory of Christ to remain in the world, that itself will rise from the dead. What, what faith there was in this man who did not love our Lord. But what faith should be in us who claim that we do love him? How we should find in him all of our hope, all of our love, all of our joy. After the choir sings once again so beautifully, I'll read to you the words of the Passion of our Lord according to St. John, the only apostle to actually take his place and stand underneath the cross and witness the events thereof. And after that reading of the Passion of St. John, I'll give you the blessing with the relic of the true cross.